thanks for coming along everyone um hopefully you can all hear me okay my internet is poor at the moment um so if i cut out at any point just yell and i'll try to um sort, sort out my sound um so yes as as was mentioned my um, talk today is going to be on landscape genetics of sicilians in the seychelles um I've got to put a little disclaimer here now. Um, I, I don't really work on landscape genetics per se. Um, I work more on sort of phylo and biogeography, which is at the very, very periphery of um, landscape genetics. But hopefully I can show you how we might be moving more towards this landscape genetic approach going forward. And it's something that we're really interested in and really interested in trying to develop further. Um, so, yes, I am a lecturer in conservation genetics at the University of Wolverhampton. Um, I also uh, have affiliate positions at University of Seychelles and the Natural History Museum in London as well. Um, if you want to drop me an email at any point, um, these are my two different email addresses at the bottom. So you can drop them an email or give me a follow and send me a message if need be on um, Twitter as well, with the Twitter handle at the bottom. Okay, so I'm gonna just very briefly, because I don't know what everybody's backgrounds are, give a little introduction to what landscape genetics is and why it might be interesting to um, landscape ecology. Um, so landscape genetics tries to merge three distinct fields. So this spatial statistics linked with landscape ecology and then conservation genetics and try to put it all together into this field which is landscape genetics and within the last sort of five ten years landscape genetics started to take off more and more and more um, it's still sort of in its infancy in some of the amphibians and reptiles but it's becoming more and more common um, so what i will do now is introduce you all to the wonderful world of sicilians um, which some of you know what they are already. Um, if you don't, then this is a Sicilian. So Sicilians are a third group of amphibians. Um, so you have three orders in amphibians. You have the Anura, which are your sort of frogs and toads, your Chordata, which are your salamanders and newts, and then your Sicilians, which are the sister group to the uh, sorry, to your frogs and toads and salamanders and newts. And the entire order, which consists of about 213 species so far recognized, um, the, the entire order are limbless and predominantly burrowers. So they are, the vast majority of them are fossorial, um, but not all of them. Um, this is a sort of typical form. So they are quite slender in body. Um, lots of people confuse them for earthworms. This is likely to be the smallest species in the world on the screen now, and it's probably about that big fully grown. And this is actually one of the Seychelles species. Um, but they can get really, really large, and some species in South America can get to nearly two meters in length. Um, lots of people haven't heard of them because they are burrowers and because they live in the tropics as well. So unless you're actively searching for them, most people don't encounter them very often. Um, unlike other amphibians, one of the adaptations to burrowing is that they have highly ossified skulls and some species are so ossified that their eyes are completely covered over with bone. They still have little remnants of eyes underneath um, but completely covered in bone. Um, they have these annuli around the body so this is why quite often I think people confuse them with worms. Um, and they have a really cool, unique feature among vertebrates, which is a tentacle. So you might be able to see this little bump just at the tip of the snout here. So that is a tentacle and it probably has some olfactory purposes, but we don't, we don't fully know. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the study system that we will be um, looking at today. Um, and we're predominantly focusing on, well, we are focusing on the Seychelles. Um, if you don't know where the Seychelles is, 
it sits pretty much in the middle of the Western Indian Ocean. So between Africa, Madagascar and India. And it's this little dot that you might be able to see in this little square. Um, there are a lot of islands within the Seychelles. Um, and the ones that we're going to focus on today are the granitic ones, which are these ones on the screen here. And the main ones are Mahe, which I'll be talking quite a lot about, um, Silhouette, Pralin, Ladig, and Frigate. Okay, so I don't know how this particular graphic is going to work, but hopefully you can sort of see it to some extent. So the reason that the Seychelles has amphibians on is because it performs what is considered a microcontinent. And part of this meant that when Gondwana was breaking up, a landmass consisting of India, Madagascar and the Seychelles broke away. Then what happened was Madagascar in, uh, sorry, India and Seychelles broke off Madagascar and then moved north. India and Seychelles split. I'll just play this again if I can. No, it's not going to let me. But India and Seychelles split at around 75 million years ago, 75 to 65 million years ago. And then Seychelles pretty much stayed where it is now and India carried on moving northward until it hit mainland Asia. And that's why you get the Himalayas in um, mainland Asia. That is the reason that you get so many amphibians on the Seychelles, unlike a lot of other island groups. And that is really interesting um, from the perspective of how long they've actually been there for. So there's at least two groups that have been isolated on the Seychelles for 65 million years, give or take, and coming into contact with conspecifics never in that time. And because there's lots of islands in the Seychelles, the sea level is actually um, quite shallow between a lot of the islands. And as we know, if we look at global sea level changes, sea levels have dropped and fluctuated massively within the sort of last 500,000 years to uh, 10 million years. Sorry, I don't know why it seems to be timed and the slides are moving along on their own without me pressing them. Um, even within the last 10,000 years, so that's here, sea levels would have been about 145 metres below what they currently are. And you can see all of these fluctuations. So this is um, 10 sort of thousands of years along the top here. So within 10,000 years, 145 metres below present sea level. And we've had these repeated episodes of um, rises and drops in sea level. What we can actually see if we look at some of these Seychelles islands now, so they're in green here, and when different levels of sea level drops, so low stands in sea level, we can see how the islands might have been connected. So if it's 20 metres below present sea level, there would have been some sort of island connection between Mahe and these sort of nor more northerly islands up here. With 40 metres below present sea level, we get a huge um, mix, so most of the islands would have been connected to each other, and then with just 60 metres below present sea level, all of the islands would have been connected. But it's worth noting that there is this sort of channel, this deeper channel that separates this island of silhouette with the remaining ones. Sorry, it's just moving on on its own. We can see that with the 60 metres, this is just here, and for a lot of the last sort of hundreds of thousands of years, all of the islands would have been connected in those times. So what we actually see now isn't necessarily representative of what's gone on throughout much of the evolutionary history of lots of the organisms within the Seychelles. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but as I said, a lot of what I study is um, phylogeography, so looking for common patterns of um, evolutionary history between our organisms. So these are on the left here, these are just reduced representations of phylogenetic trees. And the red islands on each of these um, sort of branches, if you like, represent the, isle the individuals that 
occupy that particular branch on those islands. Um, I don't want you to take too much away from this or interpret this too much, other than that we do see common patterns within the Seychelles. So a lot of, in, a lot of species have a southern island group, so that's mostly of this one, southern island group, and a northern island group. Right? So this doesn't bear any representation on what we know um, might happen during different stands in sea level, and it's possible that these, um, these the barrier to gene flow might be more isolation by distance um, rather than sea level being a major issue. We also get some more structuring in some of the species um, whereby we have northern island groups um, but separated again with um, this island of Ladigue, which actually interestingly has a different type of habitat to Praalen, which is the neighbouring island and then a more southerly population as well. Okay, I'm just gonna introduce you to the Seychelles Sicilians and then I'm gonna give you some examples and then try to focus a little bit more on some of the common patterns that we, or, or uncommon patterns that we might see within the Seychelles Sicilians. And I'm gonna draw us in a little bit later into specifics of mahe, which is quite interesting. And other studies haven't really looked at what is happening within an island. And that's more where I feel the landscape genetics will and is fitting in. So the Seychelles Sicilians are an endemic radiation. So they all stemmed from this isolation about 65 million years where India split away from the Seychelles. What we then, sorry, the, the slides are moving on their own again for some reason. I must have set a timer without realising, so I apologise about that. Um, there are eight nominal species in three genera, so Grandisonia, Hypogeophis and Pralinia. What is um, quite remarkable is this, this eight species doesn't necessarily sound like a lot if you study um, other types of organisms, but for Sicilians, this is a substantial amount of global diversity. So it's about 4% of global diversity occurring on these few and small islands. So that is, is quite remarkable. They are superficially similar, but very diverse. And I'll talk a little bit about this and how this might play about what we see with the genetics. And they only occur on the larger granitic islands like the other um, Seychelles amphibians. So I'll just get these up. So these are the eight species of Seychelles Sicilian. Um, the P obviously stands for Pralinia, the G for Grandisonia, and H for Hypogeophis. Um, what you will see is they're all brown, they look quite similar from initially, but they have quite different biologies. Um, and when you actually get close and look at their heads, they have very distinct features, many of them, um, including position of this tentacle and size of the tentacle, shape of the head, and I'll show you a bit more of that on the next slide as well, um, and um, life history. So for example, Pralinia cooperi, so this species up here, um, this has the longest larval stage of any other Seychelles amphibian. Um, or any, probably any other amphibian globally. So the, the larvae, um, so if you think about amphibian, it means two life stages. Um, so they have a larval stage and an adult stage. Obviously, we know that is not the case in all amphibians, as well as deemed amphibians. Um, they have this extended larval stage, which actually, sorry, it's still moving across. They have this extended larval stage which means that they get to pretty much adult size before metamorphosing and turning into an adult. Then Grandisonia sechelensis and Grandisonia lavata have a brief larval stage, but that is fully aquatic. For Hypogeophis brevis, Hypogeophis pitti, Montanus and Grandisonia alternans, we actually don't know what the, um, the, 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 whether they have larvae or not. 
Um, so th they're still a bit of a mystery and we still need to do more work to try and discover what, 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 how, to, how they actually breed, or how, how they, how, whether, they, whether they have a larval stage or not. And then interestingly, Hypogeophis rostratus, which is this one at the bottom here, that has no larval stage, so it's direct developing. So it lays eggs, when the eggs hatch, they are mini versions of the parent. Um, what is interesting though, is that as adults, pretty much all of the species are fully terrestrial and fossorial. Whereas Hypogeophis rostratus is semi-aquatic. So although it doesn't have this larval stage, it spends a substantial amount of time in the water as an adult or whenever it's born. All right, so this image is gonna look quite scary now, and this is where we get down to some genetic data. Um, I appreciate that not everyone is uh, gonna understand um, or, or are geneticists in the audience, um, and there's several different forms of genetic data that I analyzed. Um, I don't want you to take too much away from this, other than those common patterns that we saw in, in, in a few slides earlier, whereby lots of similarly related species showed common patterns where they either had this northern group and a southern group. This isn't what we see in the Sicilians at all. And the different species show different patterns between the different islands. So some of the species show northern lineage and southern lineage groups. Some species show silhouettes. So this island here where that deep trench ran as separated from all of the other islands. And some species show absolutely no genetic variation across the entirety of their range. So they're a really nice model to look at and investigate patterns of diversification and how landscape features might actually impact the evolution. Um, just to point out some of the similar, um, or that they look similar but morphologically different, um, that we talked about earlier. These are just some CT scans uh, that we did of the skulls to look at morphological variation among the species as well. So you can see that there's a variety of morphological features that the Sicilians of the Seychelles have. All right, this is what I want to spend the majority of the, the rest of this seminar looking at now. Um, so specifically on Mahe, because I think this fits into the landscape um, genetic theme a little bit more. So Mahe is reasonably small, so it's about 11 um, kilometers from one end at the top to the other. So on the left, this image here shows relative elevation of Mahe. And what it shows is that generally quite low lying, but it is the highest island. And at the very top, the highest elevation is about 905 meters. And that is in this particular area here, um, which forms part of a national park, which is Monsage Awa National Park. Okay. Interestingly, a lot of the forest in Seychelles actually remains in place, um, although, Granted, a lot of it isn't native forest, um, but it is still forest. Um, on the right, then, this is some, some, um, some, some, a little bit of information about um, land use in Mahe. And what you can notice here is that the majority of the people living in Mahe live along the, uh, along the coast. So this is this light blue color around here. Um, you get a few patches scattered around and these generally follow um, main roads crossing from one side of the island to the other. What is quite important to note actually is that the, well, this, this, this map here, so this is the only shape file that I could get, gather that showed land use in Seychelles. Um, this is actually taken from 1993. And unfortunately, we know from being there and actually doing field work that there has been more human encroachment into some of the um, forests, especially following these roads. So in 
in a more if you did a more recent land use map you'd see that some of this area would become much more blue and this area up here would be blue as well okay but what we can see is that there's this core of habitat of forested habitat which is important for Sicilians to live in that runs down the sort of center of Mahe which is where the higher elevations are so you can see that there are some lower elevation areas such as here 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 and here and that is generally where these roads actually run through at these lower elevations so as I said, lots of people have done um, phylogeographic studies in the Seychelles um, and they've done it between islands rather than intra-specifically or intra-island variation. So that's what we wanted to look at a little bit more um, with this work. Um, as most of the species in the Seychelles like to, uh, well, rely on water for reproduction. So the larval stage of them needs to have water. Um, this potentially, this is what we might hypothesize, is going to impact distribution. So the, how, how the water bodies and the rivers and streams actually zigzag through the habitats. Um, this is just a little study that we um, did earlier this year, not on Mahe. Um, and we used sort of semi-quantitative plots and actually tested how far away you get from watercourses to how many Sicilians and Sicilian eggs you find. So we can see that the further that you get away from um, pools, so this is just one pool and one, one data set here, we've done this several times, um, and we can see that once you start moving away from the water's edge, you start seeing a decrease in Sicilian numbers. If you don't, not necessarily, so they do occur further away, but they become a lot less common. And when they're reproducing, they are very close to the water's edge. And this is because they will hatch out of the eggs and just move straight into the water course. So they need to be really close, but not actually in the water. So just on the water's edge. So this actually supports what we, what we might assume in that water courses are likely to impact massively on Seychelles, Sicilian, um, how, how well they can spread and move and use the habitats. So they're gonna be very reliant to stay close to these water courses. And potentially this is what we see. We don't know for definite, um, but this is a on one of the species, the Hypogeophis rostratus, um, which is one of the species that we do not know whether they have a larval stage. Well, no, sorry, we do know that they have a larval stage. Um, no, sorry, I'll start again. They do not have a larval stage, but they are reliant on watercourses because they are semi-aquatic. Um, so they likely move through the watercourses quite a lot. Um, but it is worth noting that they can be found in quite dry habitat as well. Um, so this is, a, um, this is a structure plot on the right here, and it's basically an assignment test. So it assigns individuals. So each one of these bars across is an individual, um, and it shows how, how, how related they might be to a given population. Okay, so... A population isn't a true population, if you like, it's just a clustering algorithm. So if you like, the red is population one and the green is population two. So how shows how much relatedness, how much a, a sharing of genetic information, if you like, uh, goes on between different individuals. And what you can see is this is where we sort of assume middle Mahe is. So this is northern Mahe, middle Mahe, and then southern Mahe. So we've sort of separated it out based on what we've been finding genetically. And you can see that there is some variation whereby the ones this side of Mahe, so a, the northern side of this key peak in the Mourne Seychelles National Park actually differs from this middle Mahe population, which is here. Granted, there's quite a nice mix, but it suggests that there's some sort of barrier to gene flow. 
And then the southern population is quite distinct um, from the northern one at least. But the middle Mahe, even though it's very close to this northern group, actually shares quite a lot of allelic variation with this southern population, suggesting that there might be a little bit more well, yeah, we're, we're missing a substantial part of the range here, so it'd be quite nice to fill in some gaps here. But this is quite interesting in itself. And whilst the high peaks are around this area, which seems to separate them, by no means would it be a barrier to gene flow, that just the sheer elevation, we wouldn't have thought. Because um, at the lowest point around here, which they could quite easily cross, and their distribution does move right across here. Um, we actually, it, it, it's only about 500 meters above sea level and we found this species up to about 600 or more meters. So it's, it's definitely within their range to be able to cross it. So there might be something else impacting them here. And when we've looked at this in more detail, what we can actually see is that this side of Morn Seychellois National Park we actually have rivers that move this way down the mountains. And on this side of Mont Seychellois National Park, we have rivers moving to the north. So we have this, this distinct river pattern whereby we have the ones on the southern edge of Mont Seychellois National Park moving south. So the watercourse is going south, and the northern part of Mont Seychellois National Park moving towards the northern coast. So if we look at this with Grandisonia alternans now, um, you're gonna to have to bear with the different colors. Um, so this at the top is a cluster plot, um, uh, similar to the last one, so a structure plot. Um, and instead of with AFLP data this time, it is with microsatellite markers, which function in a similar way from a population genetic perspective. And what, so maybe you can't properly see it from here because the colors aren't very good. Um, but what we do have is a Northern lineage, a middle lineage and a Southern lineage. Um, although the middle and southern lineages are much more linked than the northern lineage here. And in fact, the green population up here is really distinct in some nuclear markers and mitochondrial markers. So much so that we were thinking that it could potentially be indicative of a new species. Um, what is interesting though, so you see that we have this gray population here, which is what we're considering the middle lineage, this Northern lineage here, and then the Southern lineage here. But what we actually have at this particular area, so a few populations specifically around here, they seem to be hybrids and they seem to be hybridizing quite a lot with this, between this Northern lineage and Southern lineage. So what this might indicate is that the northern lineage is moving this way and then interbreeding with the southern lineage here. But again, this is sort of links in with a similar pattern to what we actually see with Hypergophus rostratus. Then if we look at Hypergophus brevis, um, so this only occurs on May, we see a similar pattern again whereby we have this northern lineage, this southern, uh, sorry, this middle lineage, which to be fair is quite similar with the southern lineage in nuclear DNA, um, but, but not um, with mitochondrial DNA, they seem to be quite distinct. Um, but this northern lineage is very distinct. And what we can hypothesize from this is that rather than elevation being a, to being the true, um, actually impacting Sicilian diversity and potentially other organisms that are reliant on watercourses, it is the watercourses that are, um, that are, I guess, deciding the fate and evolutionary history and how Sicilians are moving and exchanging genetic information throughout their um, habitats. 
Okay, so I think that's about 30 minutes. So I realize I, I probably whizzed through quite a few things and I would be very happy to answer questions after this um, and expand on anything because um, I realized that was my time. Um, but there's a huge number of people to thank for this, um, both well in the UK, USA, and particularly within the Seychelles who have been um, really, really paramount to our work out there and have been assisting us to no end and generating new data themselves. And it's, yeah, so it's a real pleasure working with them. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone that's been helping me in this project. Thank you.